welcome to the show, The Other Side of the Curve. I'm your host, Deborah Katz, and I am thrilled to have two very special guests today. This show is all about interviewing extraordinary people who are living extraordinary lives, doing extraordinary things, going well and above, beyond the extra mile in whatever they do in their professions, always striving to improve their own performance and the performance and lives of others. And so today I'm really excited to start off introducing Ed Reardon and Daz Smith. And Ed, I'm really glad it was your idea to come together and you've been saying that you've been wanting to have someone interview Daz Smith. So I thought, well, who better than to have yourself interview him with um, myself too, because I always have a million questions for Daz. Daz is the editor of Eight Martinis Magazine, and both Daz and Ed have been remote viewers for a very long time. And I thought that even though what we're going to be doing here is really talking about the details of this work and this profession, and just talking about whatever we're most passionate about, just for those who are new to the subject, if we could just get very brief definitions of what you see remote viewing is. And let's start off with you, Ed. Oh, definition of what remote viewing is. To, uh, well, that's, I'll, say, I'll say what remote viewing is to me. Uh, remote viewing is a perceptual expression uh, for um, our ability to access other dimensions our ability to access other realities somehow. We don't know how, but we seem to ha have the ability to do it. And remote viewing is, is our ability to express that, uh, either on uh, paper or whiteboards uh, or some type of media. Uh, that's what remote viewing is to me. To, my, to me, remote viewing is a, is a form of perceptual expressionism. Okay, thank you. And Des, how about yourself? Um, to me, remote viewing um, is kind of a creative process, really, and it's a, it's a process whereby a person that we call a remote viewer can essentially uh, access objects, events, people, places, uh, remote from them in, in time and space. And so really it is about using one's psychic abilities, intuitive abilities, but you agree with that. I mean, I know sometimes I hear um, remote viewers say, well, we're not really being psychic. And I'm like, well, wait a second. This is all about being psychic. What, why do you do that? Yeah, it's definitely uh, using, uh, I tend to not use the word psychic if possible. I use the word uh, intuitive because um, psychic tends to have uh, a few negative connotations out there in, in, in the wider world. Um, for me, it's using your intuitive ability, which, uh, again, I feel is very, uh, very close and maybe even be the same thing as, as your creative ability is. It's, it's both at the same time, I believe. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Ed? Well, I think, uh, I think that um, we, we tend to repeat a lot of the things that um, were, were were taught or whatever in regards to remote viewing. So they didn't really want to use the term psychic in the military because it's so loaded, like Daz says. Um, but I think it's a, it's kind of a, an unusual word and it's hard to really define what it really is. And um, I, I, I'm kind of okay that we kind of moved away from it. I think remote viewing is a, is a very good term. Uh, we got some other terms for it that I think are more neutral that, that allow us to kind of try to understand the process. Remote viewing is a process, um, and and that, and that's that's a very important thing to to keep in mind about it. So trying to fit it into one word, um, I think, is where we kind of get into trouble, and it becomes confusing. And I've been trying to kind of focus on that a lot in my videos because a lot of these terms really confuse people. And I think there's a lot of even remote viewers or people who are trying to learn remote viewing, uh, they become confused by them as well. And so I think if we, as we continue to kind of break out of some boxes or some, some ways that we have been, that remote viewing has been presented to us, 
uh, I think we're going to kind of expand out and be able to kind of describe it in, in different things other than psychic or, or, or those types of things. But is it a psychic um, uh, expression? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned your videos, Ed, because I, I love watching your videos. They're very in, informative and, and they give us such a great look into the, the inner workings of a remote viewer's mind and everything you go through. And I, I love having you and Daz together because you do your videos as far as at your house, just showing your processes as, as you do different targets that either you've chosen or someone has chosen for you. And then Daz, obviously, may, maybe our viewers don't know, he has been working um, with the Farsight Institute um, as a independent viewer. He does a lot of other things apart from that, but he's been the one of the main viewers along with Dick Elgeyer in some incredible projects where they looked at things like the Phoenix Lights and 9-11 and what was the most recent project as that you worked on? Um, there's two, there's two, uh, the, uh, and it was a, two projects in one because Courtney does like to mix them up. Uh, it was the JFK assassination and also a psychological kind of examination of Hitler. Yeah, I can't wait to hear about that. And maybe you can give us a, a few things that you discovered about Hitler as we're going on here. But the re reason I, I love having you guys here is because there really isn't that many viewers right now doing things on video demonstrations. A lot work so much on their own in their own homes, and then maybe they get together as groups and share their work, uh, ex exchanging their sessions. But it's just incredible to be able to see it on camera and, and see that inner process. Um, and you know what, one of the things that strikes me when I see you guys work is just, I'm sure you're the same way that many times we hear these, psych these skeptics who are debunking remote viewers or psychics. And I think, my gosh, if they understood the amount of work that goes into what we do as far as training ourselves and practicing and just that there's a lot of anguish and angst in what we do because, you know, we never know if, if we're right. We're trying so hard to get the incorrect data out and we work so hard. So the idea that there's people out there that either just think we're, we're um, lying or we're faking or something when we just know i mean you guys i'm sure like lose sleep over did you do your sessions right and how can you improve right that this is how it is for so many viewers and yet people just don't get to see this until sometimes when they see your work i think it helps give a little more insight well i think i think so um i think that that um the the importance of putting out work on video is that it gives people um, a perspective on what remote viewing is that they just can't get if they're listening to a radio show or even if they see uh, paper sessions on a PDF file or something like that where they're looking at specifically at the results. Uh, I think that that's looking just at the results. This is my point. This is my particular point of view is that too much emphasis on just the results is like looking at that image of the tip of the iceberg. You know, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg and below the water is, is everything else. And I'm interested in everything else. Uh, and I think that the, the importance of video is that it's showing everything else. It's showing the, the expression, it's showing the process, it's showing uh, what it looks like to go into a space where you're accessing some other dimension. And, and I think that has been the missing piece for uh, how people even look at this to topic. Because prior to that, it was, uh, you know, somebody on a radio show coast to coast or something like that, where they're listening and, and what are they talking about? They're talking about the results. You know, they're talking about the the topics you know the dooms and doom and gloom crap or they're they're talking specifically about results only and and so the 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 point of view is on this one specific thing but there's there's so much more you know there's so much more to the process than just the end result 
And so the video aspect of it allows people to say, okay, well, that's what it looks like when someone is going into this space. You know, they're not in a dark room and, you know, and the eyes are rolling back and, you know, they're doing, it's, it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother thing. And, and so I think that, that this kind of work um, is inspiring a lot of people. I know that Daz's projects uh, inspire a lot of people. They're, they're hitting on things that people want to see because you have, you have to, you know, like, like Courtney is, is an expert marketer. So he knows how to market really well. So the, this, this, the subject matter is kind of is marketed well and it gets a lot of interest. So people get to see topics that they're interested in as well as seeing what the process or what, what it looks like for Daz Smith to go into the space that he goes into to produce the kind of, amazing results that he produces or Dick Algar, what, what Dick Algar goes through in, in the process of, of moving this, this, uh, perception, this thing that's inside of him and inside of death and being able to unload that onto a whiteboard and what that looks like. It's, it's, in my view, it's the missing piece as to, as to how people even look at this topic biggest problem that I've found in all these years is how people actually look at remote viewing and it's been in this very narrow little little box um, and, and that, that box is starting to explode yeah and a lot of that is because they're not with us when when we're doing this and they don't get to see the, the whole process and, and they're not with us for, through the beginning and every little step um, Daz, can you tell us what it's like to do your sessions on video and, and how has this changed your work? Because you've been doing remote viewing for years. Is, is it changing your, even the information that you get or the quality or level of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I pretty much mirror what Ed was saying, really. Um, and I have to be honest, when, uh, when Courtney approached me and said, you have to start doing your sessions on video now, I was quite... Uh, hesitant to do this you know being a, a remote viewer that was stuck to paper all these years I didn't really see the need for it and I, didn't, I really did not want to do it um, but it, it, it the weird thing is it, it actually flowed quite well it, it came quite natural and I think because because we use CRV and it's essentially a process where the the six stage method is, is there to um, distract the mind uh, I think the the uh, when you're at home doing all the videoing yourself, like like we are, um, it's doing the video is doing the same thing really because I'm there being the sound person, the engineer, the video technician, and everything. I'm so worried about getting that right and getting the camera and focus and everything before I'm even doing the remote viewing. I don't even have time to think about the target at all or what I'm meant to be getting. So I think I think that the remote view. Uh, the videoing of the remote viewing acts in exactly the same way as a distraction process. But not only that, I found that over the years using CRV, I tended to uh, throw away and not move into stage six, which was the modeling of the target, where you get your whole body involved in the target and your whole body then becomes the receptor for all the signals. Uh, because it was just too much trouble to get modeling K and bits and pieces out. And you know, most times I just could not be bothered to, to do that. But what I'm finding is that the video whiteboard process is doing the exact same thing that Ingo envisioned the stage six would do. You know, you're stood there in front of a whiteboard with a pen. So your whole body is becoming engrossed in the process of remote viewing. And I feel that, uh, I feel that you do get some really extra strong signals start, start flowing through when you're doing that process. Yeah, and for our listeners that are new to this subject, um, when you say CRV, you're talking about controlled remote viewing, and that's the methodology that Ingo Swan helped develop when he was a contractor for the military and working with the research units and, and the um, teaching the guys who went on to be in the operational units of the military, like Lynn Buchanan and, and Paul Smith. Um, and so part of that methodology does, it, it's, it's, there's, parts of it that are designed to distract you. Like you have to keep your paper organized and you have to do certain steps. And when you first start out doing it, it's, it's almost annoying or almost impossible to do because 
You're like, how can I be intuitive when I have to be writing or keeping track of all this stuff? But the beauty of it is because you're busy, it's freeing you up and then the information just starts flowing. So that's pretty much what you're referring to. Um, Des, can you tell us, I'm so curious with this latest project um, where you were remote viewing Hitler, can you tell us about that? Where did you have any idea who the subject matter was? Um, first, if you can answer that. Sure. Um, it was a Farsight project and um, uh, Courtney uh, tends to mix things up with these projects. So um, it was called Target, uh, Target 14, I believe. Yeah, Target 14. So that was the only information we had on it was it was Target 14. Um, but what Courtney did was he, uh, he had two targets as part of the same, multiple targets actually as part of the same project, but two main subject matters. One was the assassination of JFK and one was Hitler. So one day I'd be doing, as part of Project 14, I'd be doing JFK, and the next day I'd be doing a, a target part of it, and it would be Hitler. So it was very confusing because mm. I, was, I was saying to Courtney, I, and you know, he does this on purpose, so I can see why he does it, to keep us off, off balance. But at the same time, as a remote viewer, when you're slowly building up a picture of the target in your mind, it kind of interrupts the flow but and i guess that might be con construed as being a, a good thing really but so some that's, that's, let me ask you. you were going back and forth between the hitler sessions yes. and the, wow that's yes. that's great that's great and you didn't so, know you didn't know who they were though right you just knew this you did you know it was even a person uh, what, no, what, we, what was your front we line? didn't have, we didn't have any information the only information we had up front was it was target 14 um, so I didn't know it was two different people. Or I didn't even know it was people. Um, I mean, after my very first initial session, I kind of, you know, because you get data form in your mind, you have an idea. Uh, and the, uh, the very first session I did, I had some very strong data that the, uh, the target involved a passenger and it was a passenger that was in a car or a vehicle. Um, but it was also a passenger that was a, a, a passenger to an event that was happening around them. Um, so very, very early on, I kind of, you know, now I'm looking back on it, I kind of had the idea in my mind that it was slowly building, that it might have been something like JFK, because um, there, there aren't too many targets that you can think of in history that involves a person in a vehicle in, a, in an event type situation. But the Hitler, the Hitler thing was a complete red herring to me i didn't you know i didn't think that at all all i can say to courtney was uh, on days i'd go back to him i'd say i'm sorry Courtney, i just don't believe i'm on target because yesterday i really like this person i'm viewing and today i really hate them because they're really evil so i don't understand why why i'm mucking up here <laughs> and that was because he was keeping us off balance and all he would come back and say well you you'd be there going you know you're on target just carry on don't don't act on it. Just ignore it. Just carry on to do what you're doing. Um, but they, there are two different projects, though, right? Or was yes. it? Okay, so it was like uh, Project 14 and Project 13, or something like that, or uh, Project 14A and Project 14B. So, so Project 14A was JFK and B was Hitler. I believe. What? So yes, yes. Wow! Oh, that makes it even cooler, dude. So that makes, yeah, that makes it even cooler. Much that makes it much cooler. It's co it's com it's complex, yeah. So I can understand why he does it, but you know, I can also see from my point of view as being a remote viewer that there's a possible that um, there's an overlay between you know there might be an overlap or an overlay between the t the two because you know what I'm doing. 14b and i don't know it's a different target i might just think it's the same target but in a different situation i'm kind of getting evil bad stuff and i'm now thinking and i'm contradicting myself in my mind i'm thinking well he went evil yesterday he, he was a nice guy so why am i getting bad stuff today I, you know so you, it starts making you question yourself which could be a bad thing no, let, let me ask you when, when you when you're getting into um you know this i like this guy's evil or i like this guy here I like this guy's evil where are we at on the process here? Are we beyond the paper sessions and into the whiteboard area? What, 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 what um, part of the experiences are we, are we talking about when you're into the mode of, of this guy, I'm getting this, I don't like this guy and I like this guy. How far along into the process are we, are we talking at? Yeah, that stage uh, would be past the paper part. The paper, 
we do do paper sessions, but they're pretty much warm up sessions, really, just to kind of get us loosely on target. And then he says, okay, you know, you're kind of there or whatever, you know, go straight to whiteboard and just do the same thing and expand it. Um, and it's there. Yeah. I think, uh, the real hardcore detail now, uh, flows a lot more in front, in front of the camera and on the whiteboard. Let, let me ask you, now let, I, I want to get into the red hair because you call it a red hair. Okay. So you had a target that was really, um, surprising to you or, or like, um, I don't know how to describe it, but let's take me into the part where you're starting to develop that type of reaction to it. Is it in the paper end of it? Is it in the, the whiteboard end of it? When are you starting, where are you, where are you starting to switch over from, all right, there's people over here, there's that over there. Okay, there's something, this is over here. Where, where are we at? Take me into that. Take me into where you're going into that. If you take me into your memories of that. Okay. Um, well, for example, on the, on the JFK session, um, I kind of, as I said, I, you know, past the paper sessions, when I first went to whiteboard, I kind of really started to think to myself, okay, this is, this is feeling a little bit like, uh, JFK because, um, I was picking up details of a person in a vehicle and they were in an event and there was crowds around and they were all proud and, you know, they were all happy. Um, but then the event changed, changed instantly. And, you know, I'm in front of the whiteboard doing this. So I'm doing my ideogram and my sketches and, you know, all this data is kind of just flowing through. Some of it did come through on paper, but not, not too in detail. It, come, it becomes more detail, you know, on the whiteboard. And at that stage, you know, I see this, this person, he, you know, I know he's in a vehicle. I know he's moving. I know it's an event and then all of a sudden I feel that, you know, I just know that there's a change. There's a change in the event. Um, and I see other motion as well. I see motion from two different angles in front moving towards the vehicle and stopping the vehicle. Uh, I know that this is an explosive motion. So after a time, you know, you explore this and you pick up and I start to see that, that you know, it's people that, and it looks like, well, it looks like some kind of, you know, a, a angry, violent assassination type event. I know this, but at the same time, I'm trying to not verbalize this and say this. So I'm trying to be as descriptive as possible still. Let, 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 t take me into the Hitler one. Like, like the JFK one, like you say, okay, there's a, there's a person in a vehicle and there's something going on there. And it's like, wow, there's not a lot of those things in history. So uh, we, we can understand that. But the, the Hitler one, like you're saying, really was like out of, out of a nowhere kind of a, kind of a target. Which, yeah. And, and so take me through the progression, if you would, of the, was it in the paper end of it to where, where you're starting to immerse into it, to, the, to, to get to the point of, wait a minute, there's an evil guy here. Take me in to follow me, let me follow along with you as you're going from the process into the experience of it. Okay. Um, the Hitler one was quite different. Uh, again, it was, uh, we did the preliminary work on, on paper, uh, just to warm us up. And then we went to, to, to the video for the hardcore. And the Hitler one was, a, a, it was completely different for me. And I, I'm not sure I picked up as much on that one as I did on Kennedy. Um, maybe because I did have a dislike for you know, I just had a dislike for the, the internal feelings I was feeling towards this. Explain that to me, if you could. Well, when did you start feeling a dislike? How did it come through and how, how did you express it? It's, uh, it kind of comes through uh, and it's, it's on the video really, but you can kind of see me probing the, uh, I probe the life form, you know, because I know it's a life form that's involved in the target by this stage. So I essentially go into the mind and the body of this life form and start, feeling my way around and it's kind of like a real subtle feeling but internally within me I just know that this isn't a nice you know this isn't a nice person that this is a person that's involved in some nefarious activities um was there was there a point where um you felt it switched uh, like you you were you were going from okay I think that the main thing I need to focus on here is a person um and then um, do, do you recall when, when something switched or clicked over for you that 
um, okay, yeah, I don't like this person and that kind of thing. Was it, can you, do you recall the moment when that started to take over? Only in so much as that it was in front of the, in front of the whiteboard, um, doing what we, you know, some people like to call it like the Star Trek mind probe type thing. I don't know what you call it. I just like go inside the person and, and, and see what I pick up. And was there some things about Hitler that you learned that you hadn't realized before? I mean, once obviously, and for people who are just tuning in, um, again, Daz is describing a session where he didn't know that he was assigned to look at Hitler, but that was actually the target. So when you did learn it was Hitler, what did, did you have any aha moments like, wow, I didn't realize this about him, but now I, I've learned something from my session? Only, only after I had feedback really, because uh, right, right until I had the feedback, you know, I, well, I didn't even know it was two people. You know, I just thought I was viewing a, a person that was good on one day and bad on that. I just didn't know. I tried not to think about it. Um, but yeah, what I, you know, what I found interesting on, on doing some research and finding my own feedback was uh, in the session, I picked up a lot of um, uh, abuse, Hitler being abused when he was younger. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was uh, physical or sexual, but there was a, definitely a lot of mental abuse there, um, which caused uh, an amount of schizophrenia uh, and um, yeah, a lot of mental problems within the, the person that I was viewing. Uh, which caused them to um, not not be trust you know not trust um, have a lot of issues with people and I picked up all this kind of stuff and I picked a and I think part of the target as well for both these were because they were both uh, at certain points they were both death events as well so I followed both JFK and uh, Hitler past the point of both of them dying. Uh, to what happens afterwards as well, to, to what we can essentially call an afterlife. Um, now, this wasn't part of Courtney's plan, and I've never done this before, ever, in you know nearly two decades. Um, but I did it in, for both those life forms. So I actually managed to um, follow the life forms through as they went through a death process, leaving behind all the uh, energies, emotions, all the worries about day-to-day -day life that we have as human beings. And then I managed to see them come through a process into a different place, a much calmer, whiter, uh, just more beautiful meditative place uh, where they met other beings. So, and that happened on both those. Um, now that's not in Courtney's video uh, because he, he, took, he took those parts out. But what me and Dick are doing is within a very short period of time, we're putting out our own DVD which is the 30 minute segment that's missing of me following JFK past a point of death into, uh, into the next realm. Oh my gosh. Well, this is just extraordinary because this is actually the first time that I've heard, not that I've heard remote viewers talk about tuning into someone after they've passed on, but traditionally it hasn't been acceptable to talk about these things. And it's not, there's been a very wide divide between let's say mediumship or um, tuning into spirits or anything like that. There's been a big divide between that and what's generally acceptable and appropriate and scientific and professional when it comes to remote viewing. So this is, this is very interesting. I, I would love to hear then, how um what did you learn did you learn anything about the afterlife and the my other question would be um did these did these souls if you want to call them that once they passed on did they have an understanding of the impact they had when they were here on earth whether positive or negative they um at the point of passing over um because like the JFK one, I, I'll use that one because it's an easier one for me because I don't know, I, I had a bit more of a, a relationship with that one, I think, because he, he was just a nicer person. Um, at the point of before death, you know, I, I could, because he was obviously shot, uh, there was all this, you know, and this is on this session as well. So there's all this anguish, anger, all these questions that were going through his mind really, really fast. But then we're talking in a matter of, you know, the whole process of, of uh, dying to passing over, I felt was uh, probably a, a process of a, a, literally just a couple of minutes. Um, so he died. Uh, and as he was dying, 
it was almost like a switch that went off and all those questions that he was asking, all those things he had in his mind about, you know, he was asking questions in his mind, you know, oh my God, uh, I had things to do, my family, you know, what's going to happen? All those almost instantly just switched and they just went. Um, then there was a very short period of time of nothing. And then that opened up into just, and it sounds, it sounds uh, like I'm just repeating what, people saying NDE stories, near-death experience stories. Um, but it was just white. It was just so calm and so white and so peaceful. You know, the whole state then just became a, a state. That, and the only time I've ever got close to it myself was in a state when, you know, I'm in total relaxation, total meditation. That's, that's as close as I can get to describing what this state was like. Uh, very white. And his whole demeanor changed. He didn't, it was almost like nothing, none of those questions or none of those feelings or none of that past instantly did not matter anymore. None of it, none of it mattered in any way. He was just totally at peace with himself. And as he was at peace with himself, um, out of the white kind of mist, uh, I saw uh, life forms form. And how they formed were, um, they were, they were, dissipated life forms so they were in more than one place and they were they were spread out like little sparkles of light spread out and the more jfk thought about what was happening in front of him the more these sparkles moved together and coalesced into in into into forms of, of almost physical beings um so yeah they were they were dissipated and non-local it was almost like these beings were everywhere all, all at the same time and it was only his his relaxation meditation or or calmness and thinking about them that coalesced them in into physical shapes in front of him wow and then what about hitler what happened with him once it was it was pretty much to be honest it was pretty much the same experience for him he uh he uh, and i felt that he i felt and I, again i don't know the feedback on this but i felt that his death was a, a violent death um because, you know, there are all these allegations that Hitler, you know, moved to Argentina and got away, all this kind of stuff. I don't know about that. Um, but, yeah, I felt that he had a violent death. And he went through the same process other than, you know, his, his movement between the two processes, this short period of time. His questions that you were asking beforehand were a lot, uh, a lot harsher, you know, because he had, a, he had a lot more that he'd done bad, you know, and, and a lot more mentally wrong with him. So, so his, his time of asking those questions, those why is, you know, all the questions that quickly run through your mind, almost like going for your life, I guess, uh, you know, recalling your life. His, his was a bit more expansive than the JFK one, but he, and I know people won't, probably won't like this, but you know, I saw him also come through some kind of veil into a, a calm, beautiful place where, uh, you know, he let go of everything that had happened in the past and he, he, had, he had pretty much the same experience. I know some people won't like that, but I can't help what, what I got really data-wise. Well, and again, for people just tuning in, this is really incredible because, again, you were totally blind to, you didn't know who these two subjects were. You didn't know that Courtney was giving you two different people and you'd go back and forth between these sessions. It's really extraordinary. And the thing that, uh, Courtney does this in his, um, I took his advanced scientific remote viewing course, and th this is part of his methodology where, for example, when you're, when you're exploring timelines, he'll, he'll tell you don't explore the past, present, and future in a linear way, do the past and then jump to the future and then go to the past again and jumping back and forth. The same thing with, he doesn't want you to spend a lot of time when you're say at ground level and then mid-level and upper level. He wants you to keep jumping back and forth so that your mind can't make those connections so that you're going to have to just be in the present moment and just let go of whatever you just got, not make those connections. And it sounds like that was kind of hard for you at times because you were remembering what you got the night before and then yeah. wanted to combine those somehow. And I'm sure you knew you're not supposed to do that, but it's you know one thing to know that and another thing to do that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's it's it was it was an interesting set of targets, and yeah, I felt that the uh, 
the 30 to 40 minute segment was so interesting on its own that uh, it shouldn't have been, you know, it shouldn't have been just thrown to one side. So yeah, me and me and Dick are producing our own uh, video DVD that's out soon. Um, wow. We've also got a few other people, and I think Lynn Lynn Buchanan's doing a part for it as well. Okay. And I think it's going to be narrated by Jeff Rents from the radio show as well. So we've got a few people involved in this. Um, yeah, and you know, it's just one of those may, maybe DVDs when you know because. We don't. There is no. There is no feedback as as yet for what happens at life after death. So I can't say it's a definite truth or anything. I'm just putting it out there as a as an interesting experience for you. Yeah. And and why didn't Courtney want to include any of that on the video? Was it because it wasn't verifiable? I don't know. We haven't we haven't really discussed that. To be honest, um, we don't we don't have a lot of uh, dialogue about these things. You know. Um, he tries to he tries to involve us you know i do bits of piece of artwork for him and stuff but essentially i'm just a you know i'm just a paid remote viewer so i just do my stuff and and i i have no say in what what happens with it really you got a question then yeah I, I want you to have time to ask your questions too um just speaking to that that's great that you did a project with courtney and yet he's he doesn't have a problem with you taking some of the material and, and creating your own videos and spreading this. And as both of you know, there's been this large controversy um, in the remote viewing communities as questions come up around ownership of material. And when a viewer works for somebody else, does the viewer own it or does the, the, does the manager or does a student own their material or does the teacher? Um, well, we don't have to get too much into this subject, but I don't want to avoid controversy. I want on this show to be able to dwell right into it. So um, maybe if we could start with Ed, what do you think about the subject? Of ownership of material uh, I think every any person creates they should own it um, <clears throat> I think that um, in terms of training uh, that's that's something you know training with remote viewing people really need to I think this this little drama this soap opera thing we we had to uh, go through is a is something that that people who are going into remote viewing they really need to to figure if they're signing forms and doing that kind of thing they really need to know what they're doing what they're signing i think i think that if if um if someone produces something they own it and outside of that i think it's anybody who who tries to um bring up a lawsuit. I think they're just ridiculous human beings. The whole, the whole thing is a ridiculous waste of time. That, that's how I feel about it. It's totally ridiculous. And if anybody were to bring that towards me um, for any reason, which I don't think they would be, um, I'd be really, I'd be really pissed about it. But it's just a, I think it would, the whole thing was a ridiculous waste of time. If you produce something, you, you, it's your work, it's your art. And um, that's, that's it. That's how I feel about it. And um, what about yourself, Daz? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, being an artist and a, and a designer and, and whatnot anyway, uh, I totally agree. And, you know, the laws, laws on your side, really, uh, anything you create as a, well, any kind of artist or writer or anything, you automatically own the copyright on. And, um, yeah, it's just ludicrous to claim otherwise, uh, especially if you can't, uh, if you can't, show any signed licensed documentation you know for example with the farsight stuff we do have we do have signed licenses with courtney whereas we say yeah uh, we allow courtney even though he pays us for the remote viewing he doesn't own it we own it as remote viewers including all the video uh, and he's licensed he has a license to use the material for promotion and for his videos but essentially uh we can do whatever we want as remote viewers with the paper and with the video sessions afterwards. Um, and it's the same, it's the same with any industry, you know, I'm a bit of a photographer as well. And people do ask if they can use my images and when I allow them to, they have to sign a license agreement with me and it should be the same with, with remote viewers as well. You all, you, we all own our own work because it's all creative work in the end. And, uh, yeah, and it was right. It's just a, it was just a ridiculous, um, 
waste of time and energy and money. And uh, I, I made it, see, Courtney and Dick didn't want to go public with it, but I made them kind of, in, in the end, go a bit more public with it because me and Courtney could both see, over a period of six weeks, we could both see that, that Dick was deteriorating quite rapidly. You know, he was losing loads of money. He was having worries. Um, uh, you, you know, he's, he's got some, he's got, he's got some illness problems and some, at the moment, you know, that he's had long-term illness problems. That's why he's on disability and stuff. So he was really deteriorating and he was, he was saying he was going to quit remote viewing and it was just really getting him down. Yeah. So we, so we had to go public with it because going public was the only way to force the hand of the people that were trying to bully really. And, um, mm-hmm. they still got away with bullying to some degree because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the other person involved, Hitomi, uh, she had, uh, without her say so, because she's got her own problems and she's in, she's in, in Japan. Um, she essentially had her, her work exercised and, and taken down. And, and there are, you know, the people involved claim that they, they own, own all her work, which is just ridiculous. It's crazy. That's crazy. I, I, I think it was great to go for you, for you to, to really push going forward because it sounds like Dick really needed the, some support. And I think that what he got was the, the support of the 99.9% of the remote viewing community who, who turned our attention towards that and said, that's utterly ridiculous. Yeah. And um, it's, it's just nonsensical. And you're referring to Hitomi. I've seen some of her work and it's incredible. And I was dismayed. I didn't get a chance to see the video that she she did. Can you just tell us a little bit about that video and how can people, if it's no longer available, how can people see Hitomi's sessions? Where can they find them? Yeah. Well, um, as much as possible, I've got, I've got quite a lot of Hitomi's work on my, on my website, remoteview.com. And I have some of, some of Ed's on there as well. Um, you know, I'm, cause I'm happy to showcase anyone's work. Um, and she's done some, she has done some amazing work. And the, uh, the God Particle DVD was, uh, yeah, it was an exceptional piece of work. It was well put together. Uh, the remote view on it looked, looked absolutely stunning. She looked like she nailed the target live on camera. And I, for the life of me, I still can't understand why uh, the people involved wanted, wanted the video uh, taken down because they all signed, they all signed agreements uh, and, you know, they all helped make the video. So it's, it foxes me really. And I, he told me, you see, She's 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 got her own health problems at the moment, and so she can't she can't literally go online. And she's I, I hear she's in recovery now, but she's got some very serious health problems. So mm-hmm. I got quite angry with it because she wasn't she's not able to defend herself. So she's had to ha- stand to having her work exercised by these people, and that kind of gets my goat a little bit. Yeah, mine too. Yeah. So uh, since we just have a few minutes left, if both of you could. Tell us, where do you think remote viewing is, is going and, and what do people really, you know, I, I think we're all in the same position of we want to advance the field and we want to advance our own work and the work of other people. So how can we best do that and where do you see us headed? Are we headed in a good direction or um, are we stagnant? Some people say we're stagnant. Mm-hmm. Who wants to go first? <laughs> you go first. I, I think that, um, well, I can only speak for myself. I, I can't speak for the remote viewing community as a whole, but for me, remote viewing is um, moving away from uh, results focus, just a complete focus on results. Uh, and moving into the direction of the experience itself. And at least that's, that's my um, passion uh, of, of what I'm doing and what I want to, to put out there is that uh, remote viewing is, a fo- is an experience. And, and it, it's not something that's easily to describe. It's, it's something that is better for someone to watch, watch them do it. Um, and see the the spaces and the dimensions and the reactions, uh, the mental processes. Um, I think re- remote viewing is is expanding out of 
its use as a military tool. I think that that uh, as a military tool, it was really compartmentalized um, and really put into a box, and, and it's coming out of the box now. And I think that the, the direction that it's going is in full-blown experience of it, um, and uh, and and seeing seeing what that's like, uh, seeing what what. It, looks like to see someone go through go through that what is it like to see someone have a a an experience of where they're in another space in another time um and that's not just end result that is the experience itself there's 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 this bubble of experience that that i think is is what um is what needs to be shown or brought out, not just the end result. And so I, I think that I think that that's where remote viewing is. It, we're kind of moving inward as opposed to moving outward uh, to it um, to and see to see what it's like as an expression, as an experience. That's how, how will that help individuals? So let's say whether it's someone who's new to remote viewing or who's been doing it for a while or even researchers to, to get yeah. that experience with you? How yeah. does it help them? How does it help? It, I think that it helps uh, in, in a, lot of different, a lot of different degrees. Uh, it helps to break people out of what they've been taught that remote, of what remote viewing is, um, that remote viewing is an information gathering tool. That's what I was taught. Back, way back in the day and I had to t take that you, you take this concept on as a belief system and so I had to take it and get rid of that remote viewing is is a, an information gathering well, that's only one piece of what it is it's so much more than that um, so there's an infinite amount of things we can look at talk about that just for a second so Talk about the other parts beyond the information gathering tool, because I'm learning something here right now because that's how I've been thinking of it as I'm getting in information. That's what I need to do. So go, go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's a, for me, it's an experience. Remote viewing is an experience and it's a form of self-expression. And so the way I gauge um, my experience is, is I'll, I will gauge it in comparison to what the point in time and space is, or the, what we call a target. Um, if, if, I'm, if I'm able to have a full-blown experience, then, then the results will, will, will show in, in what, I, what I've experienced. But inside of that is our, our, the mental processes that we have to identify. Uh, when I went through my training, there was signal and there was noise. Those were the two processes, you know. But as, as I threw away all, all, that, all that stuff that, that, uh, that was presented to me and started to study what Ingo Swan was studying, you find that there's a whole array of mental processes that exist below the threshold of our awareness. And as we're attempting to pull this, these inputs through, they're having to go through all of these mental processes. And we have to be able to identify them. And you have to go through, through the experience is where you identify which ones are which. Yeah. It's not just AOL, it's, oh no, that's memory comparison, or that's a pre-conscious process over here. It's creative additions. It's not just this flat, analytical overlay or imagination this is another one that, that really upset me a lot is where imagination is the only thing that they talk well imagination is only one of an array of mental processes that are taking place it's not the only one and yeah. so so the the pursuit is to find where the threshold of awareness is find where the subliminal barrier is what's happening below that, what mental processes exist down there, and we can find them through the use of the actual input or the target as it's moving through those processes, and we are explaining them, 
and we are describing them as best we can so that when we go back and look at it, we can say, oh, well, that's what memory comparison looks like, or that's, that's the idea generation part of the mind right there, or that's the creative part of the mind right there. And we can see it because this input was moving through it and, it, and illuminating those processes. You know, and that, that's why. I'm, I'm so glad you're bringing this up. I was just talking to some students yesterday because I've, I've written a few books on psychic development and my first one came out in 2004. And that was really before I, at that point I was doing psychic work, but it was all, it was heavy on clairvoyance and it was, it, it was a verbal method. It wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with writing. And so in my book, I, I've always wanted to really delineate between the very specific abilities, our clairvoyance, our ability to see information visually, or our clairaudience, being able to hear information. How do we hear it? Does it just land in our mind as a knowing clair, clairaudience? You know, do we, do we feel it, uh, empathy or, or clairsentience? And, and all these abilities come about when we're doing remote viewing, even though we may not be in traditionally in, in remote viewing learning, you're not using those specific words. But what I realized and, and what I don't have in my earlier books, because I just ha didn't have the written experience, is that when the act of writing or using your body like you're talking about, the unconscious does come about more. So there's moments where you're not necessarily seeing a visual, you're not hearing something, but suddenly you find your hand just writing something or you feel compelled to do something that seems ridiculous at the time that's a subconscious coming through. And so I'm so glad you're bringing this up. And I guess my question then, or maybe a thought that comes up that you could speak to is this is, these, this is something that would have to be so fascinating to any psychologist, and to, to anybody interested in consciousness studies. And yet I'm not seeing, I, I don't see you surrounded by a team of psychologists. You know, I don't- I was my mind. It boggles, boggles my mind. Yeah. Why, why it seems like that, that's one of my pet peeves in remote viewing is that uh, only certain things are interesting to people. And um, so few people are actually wanting to study our brains, really. I mean, luckily, Ingo was so high profile. He had people like Michael Persinger and, and people like that who, who wanted to, to study his brain and that kind of thing. Um, but in my opinion, um, we, we have, I don't know. It, I'm getting confused now. Just, just thinking about, cause I'm getting so excited about it. This is a big topic for me, but we need to study our brains more. We need to find out what's stimulated when, uh, what part of the brain is stimulated when we are actually in an actual remote viewing is taking place? What, what part of the brain is stimulated when an actual remote viewing is taking place? What part of the brain then gets stimulated when that input tri triggers a, a mental a memory? And now we're over here and we're looking at a memory that is related to the input. What part of the brain is that? Uh, what part of the brain then adds things on, a creative addition? What part of the brain gets stimulated when they're adding things on to the actual input? Uh, those are the things that I that I want to know. That, yes. you know that, but that has been done. It's been done. Yeah, that's been done. Persinger did that with with Ingo, you know, and they were, and they did all those type of experiments, and they uh, because I spoke to him about this, and uh, they yeah they even managed to record the perfect uh, time of when Ingo was dead on with his remote viewing and did really good results and they even managed to feed that signal back into other people and then use that signal for them to actually improve what they did with their remote viewing as well yeah we see who why is that not, not on the front page of every newspaper and, and that, <laughs> too, that was i mean yes a lot of work was done around ingo Spahn and and as i want to ask you about that a little bit more but the, but there's now hundreds of, of remote viewers who are highly trained, who are doing this work, doing it all the time. And then there's also hundreds, thousands of psychologists that are interested in transpersonal psychology, uh, all sorts of um, looking at the liminal and subliminal, but they're not, there is 
very few looking at it in terms of people doing psychic work. And it always, it, it just comes right back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this, which is that we have to get past just, just the results proving that this can happen. And, and as long as we have to keep proving it over and over again, then there's, there's not time to, for people to be studying what we're doing. That, well, let, me, let, me, let me add, let me add something to, to that, to that conversation real quick, because there's, there's another aspect of it too, because we have the, the end result part of it. Um, but we, the, the part that I think needs to be focused on is what is the nature of these inputs? What state do they exist in? And we, and as far as I know, well, we, we don't have the ability to gauge them, but I think we need to, to turn the attention towards that. You know, what state do these things exist in? Not, you know, just, you know, the, 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 the primary has been, tell me about this, you know, because that's what the military did. Tell me about what the Russians are doing. Tell me where the drugs are hidden on the ship and tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, give me information, give me information. Just provide information for me. That's, that's been the primary of it. But I think we need to turn the direction towards what, state do these things do, do these inputs exist in is it a quantum image is it inside some kind of a photon um, feel i mean i don't even know i have no idea but i want to know and i and i and we need to turn the part at least part of the attention towards what is the nature of these of these ingo swan calls them inputs you know Another term for it would be the signal line or whatever, but one of Ingo calls them inputs, and I like the term, you know, because they they're inputs. It's very neutral. But what state do they exist in? You know, is, is it quantum entanglement? Oh, that sounds that sounds great. But how do you do? How how else do we describe that? You know, and I think that we need to really look at that too. This goes along with my idea. After I attended a parapsychology association conference, I had the idea of a program called Adopt a Parapsychologist or Adopt a Remote Viewer. And wouldn't it be great if we could team up one remote viewer with a parapsychologist and a psychologist and a neurologist and a psychiatrist, just, you know, a whole team where they, they all really in-depth study the process. And even if we just had 10 of these teams working together so we could, yeah advanced understanding of, of all of this. We would, I, I believe just doing that alone could propel us forward a, a hundred years of progress. I think you're right. I like the idea. So, so Daz, then if you can, um, you actually spent some time with Ingo Swan, who unfortunately is no longer with us. And there's a lot of remote viewers who so much respect his work, but didn't get to have that opportunity. How did you meet up with him? And can you tell us what the highlights were of your meetings with him? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I got to meet Ingo because uh, over a period of years, I... Um, I ended up defending him on public forums against people that were uh, trying to tear down the original work that was done at SRI saying that it's invalidated and that it wasn't done accurately and, and all kinds of things like training doesn't work, CRV doesn't work, all this kind of stuff. And you know, this happens a lot within re remote viewing because you, we are separated into, into tribes. There's no way around it. It's a, it's a very uh, tribalistic communi community that's uh, doesn't work well together uh, so they were they were tearing him down and uh he got to hear that i was defending him and we we ended up having a dialogue over a couple of years which was very hard because ingo uh, being a very creative person but being older in years didn't like to use technology so all communication had to be done through me sending an email that then got converted to fax which was then sent to a contact of ingo's read right over the phone to Ingo, and Ingo would respond. So he, a really complicated process. But anyway, in the end, uh, he said, when you're, if you ever come to New York, uh, you can stay at mine, and uh, we'll chat about these things. So uh, I came into a little bit of money at the time, and thought, Ingo's not getting any younger, so let's, uh, let's go to New York. So I went there and, and spent a couple of days, yeah, just talking to him. Uh, 
amazing experience, uh, just like what you'd think it would be, but also a scary experience because, um, well, because it was Ingo and uh, you'd ha- you, you would have had to have experienced him to understand that really. Um, Can you tell us about that a little bit? What, what was well, scary? He, um, it's just his mannerisms, you know, he, he, uh, like I, I was sat, you know, we, we were down in his, uh, in his studio, down in his basement in front of the big millennium painting that everyone knows, uh, sat at this uh, wooden table where, where he trained all the remote viewers in the past, him at one end of the table, me at the other, uh, he was sat there with a big cigar smoking away. Mm-hmm. And at one stage during the conversation, he says, I have, I have something with you. I've written this. He says, uh, you can publicize it whenever you want. And it was like two pieces of A4 paper. He shoved it across the table to me and said, uh, okay, read it back to me. And I was like, I was like what, is this guy serious? I, I've, I haven't read to someone like this since I was in, in high school kind of thing, you know? Um, but I just felt that, you know, he's not the type of person you say no to. <laughs> so I stood up and I, I read, his, uh, read, his, read his statement and stuff. But that was only one of the, one of the things. Wait, you know. what did the statement say? Yeah, what, what was it? Oh, it, I, I've actually, it was in the last, I think it was in the last eight martinis. Um, it was a statement about how people were trying to demolish uh, remote viewing and all his work that he'd been doing through SRLA, uh, saying that training didn't work. And he essentially, I mean, the summary of it is it doesn't take 20 years of funding to work out that, that training wouldn't work, you know. Um, but he also confirmed other things to me. You know, he did kind of confirm with a nod and a wink that there was a, another secret unit that he trained, um, which has been a rumor for many years. Hmm. Uh, he also uh, showed me the feedback and coordinates and data that he did when he, um, when he did lots of the moon sessions for uh, the Mr. Axelrod from his book, Penetration where he remote view bases on the moon, all this kind of stuff. So he showed me all that and, and all the material. And he also, uh, by the side of the, the training table, it, it was just awesome. He had this big uh, stack, I'd say four and a half feet high stack of documents. Um, what it was, you know, it was stacked up layer on upon layer, uh, right by the side of him, up about this high. Uh, and it was every single one of the uh, SRI training remote viewing sessions that all the military guys did and they were just all stuck there because he kept because ingo kept everything all, all the training material and everything so and he just picked up a couple and slung them across the de- desk me to have a look at it. and it was tom mcnair tra- training sessions that, that he done you know really amazing archival stuff so you know i'm just hoping now that all this stuff is you know now that he's gone it's been um uh, taken in and it's going to be archived and one day made available to everyone Yes. Um, so I was wondering, did he talk about his book Penetration? I had heard um, that after it came out, it, it went out of print for a while. I believe it's it's back in print or at least available now, which is good because it was going for about $400 a copy. And, it, and it's one of, I, I just loved it. It was really, really fun to read and, and very enlightening. But did he talk about his feelings about that book? Because I heard for a while that he really didn't want it to, to go back into print. I asked him a question about the book, which kick-started the conversation off. Um, I said to him, Ingo, you've got to understand, you know, this book's amazing. A lot of people like it, but there are a lot of people out there that they're saying that it's not real or that, you know, the experiences are totally unbelievable. Uh, and he just looked at me flicking his cigarette, you know, his, his cigar, and he said, well, how do you think it was for me going through them? Um, so that confirmed to me that, you know, that he really, he, that he really believed that everything in that book was, was truthful. Um, and I have no reason, you know, everyone, everyone's always said that In- Ingo is an honorable person, and I have no reason to, to, to disbelieve what, what he told me, really. And, you know, he, he he essentially told me that all the experience in that book were true and they happened. Wow. And um, was there anything that you learned just about remote viewing or just life from talking to Ingo? Anything you walked away from that you hadn't known before you met with him? Only in, in some of our private dialogues. Um, 
because we had some letters that went back and forth over the years. And I said, and I said to him in one of the documents, I said, I, not a lot of people understand this, Ingo, but yeah, I think you will, that I think that remote view, CRV in particular, all it is, is, is art. I said, you know, you've got a sketching, uh, you've got us doodling at first, which is ideograms. I said, then we move from ideograms through just sketches. And then we move from sketches later on to modeling. I said, so all you've done is made us do art. And he came back to me and said, he said, hardly anyone's recognized this. He said, they, they, they've never understood this. He said, and it's, it's so funny that I actually managed to make the military pay me money to teach them how to do art. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I've carried that ever since. Uh, and being a designer as well as, as a remote viewer, I do believe the two go hand in hand. And the very place where I get my inspiration for logos, for, for photography, for any kind of creative process I do, uh, and being able to nail that for the client each time, uh, I know that the inspiration from that is feels exactly the same and comes from the exact same place as where all the remote viewing information comes from. There's no differences between the two. Well, I think that's what Inga was trying to do. And a lot of people say CRV is hard and it's really formal, but you have to get past that. You have to understand that it is essentially just art, art that's been disguised to allow you to open up those creative processes to start to get you to start thinking about talking because remote viewing as well and CRV, but remote viewing as well, it's not about learning anything other than learning about yourself, really. That's right. what I've done. That's what I've done over two decades. Is I now I can now understand the very very and we're talking really incredibly microscopic subtle impressions that come into me as a person, and it's just about uh, learning what those are over over a period of time and identifying those and uh, having confidence in in them as well. A lot of people don't have the confidence in these impressions and they you know, put them to one side, you know, and say, no, I'm not, I'm not writing that. That can't be right. But that's what it is. It's, it's, it's almost like over a period of time, I don't, I don't even care what the target is anymore. I don't even care if I'm accurate. And the moment you start not caring if you're ever going to be accurate, that's when your remote viewing becomes good. Right. You're totally detached. I'm, I'm detached from anything. I don't care. You know, half the time I don't even get feedback. I just don't care anymore. It doesn't matter. It's not part of the process for me. You know, if I get feedback, then yeah, it's, it's all good. But yeah, because I'm detached from it, uh, it just allows the creative freedom to flow that, that much better. I think, I think that, that this, I feel the same way. And I think that this is another part of the direction that it's, that it's going into um, that has been missing, you know, for the past 15 or 20 years or so. Because once... Because it, it worked for me as well. And I read it, I think I read it in your book um, that, that gave me that perspective. You were, you were talking about the Ingo story that gave me that perspective. And it, it, and it changed uh, my course in remote viewing. And how it, one of the main changes was that it frees you up so much. Um, because in a lot of the training, it's so it's so rigorous that it feels almost mental prison like. And, and some even teach it, kind of teach it that way. But once, you know, Ingo adds in the, the kicker, which is that, well, we don't want to discount the, the, the creative process. It, it just like blows the whole thing open. But I think that the, the thing about it is that it's this fine line because over in the training end, it's, be aware of your imagination be aware of your creative processes. They'll lead you astray. They'll lead you astray. They'll lead you astray. And then here you have Ingo laughing and, you know, over on this side going, yeah, it's really just all a creative process. And then over here, we're so afraid. Oh no, my imagination. Ooh, it's going to throw me off. And Ingo's laughing over here going, yeah, it's all a creative process. But I think that, 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 um, that part of it, is what is going to open it up for so many more people Uh, because I've seen a lot of people go through remote viewing training and then never do remote viewing again. You probably have seen that as well. You know, they're, they, they'll do a couple of, they'll do their training, do a few sessions and then, and then they'll be like, Oh God, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I may never do it again, but injecting that other part of it. And, and that's a big, 
big passion for me as well is, is that this is a, in a, a form of self-expression. Yeah. Take that into your work and not as opposed to, oh, I got to produce some results for so-and-so. They want answers. Oh, I'm so afraid of giving them the wrong answer. But when you get rid of that, it's just a form of self-expression. And that's the opening end of it. You know, and, and that is where it's, and that's where it's going, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, and you know, you bring you bring up an interesting topic here, and this is really a, a subject of great controversy because you have um, former SRI directors Russell Targ and Ed May who say, "Well, I Ingo, who came up with controlled remote viewing, he didn't use this extreme structured process when he he." You know, he started out just as a natural psychic and then he learned things and he was a research subject for a long time. And then he re reverse engineered what he did and came up with the system. So there's the one camp that says, well, you don't need this structure. And then the other camp that says you have to adhere to it or like you said, you're going to get astray. Um, do, you, do you just have a brief response to that? Well, Ingo, I mean... They're right and they're wrong in that. Um, they're right in the fact that you don't need it. Um, but some of us, you know, because we're all individuals, some of us work better with it. Um, and Ingo did, you know, if you look at the documentation and it's, and it's out there and I've got it on my website and in my books, um, for a number of years, the primary person that was the, the kind of guinea pig for CRV was Ingo, so he was training himself. He, he was deconstructing his own internal processes, but at the same time, he was doing it for a couple of years, learning and using CRV. So he was producing CRV sessions, and they're they're in the Stargate archives for anyone to see. Um, so the fact you know, when they say that Ingo never used the process, then that's not essentially true. He did for a number of years. Um, but CR, you know, CRV itself. I mean, before I came to remote viewing. I was a trained clairvoyant medium heater. I pretty much used every divination tool possible from tarot cards, sand reading, tea leaves. I tried them all and they all work for any individual. Anyone can use any of it and you can use any of it for remote viewing if you do it within a scientific protocol. Um, but what I found with those processes were that it was, it was, uh, it was very chaotic and the entire intuitive process was out of my control. So I was a passenger uh, in a vehicle of the, create, of, of the intuitive process. What I found with controlled remote viewing, um, it's pos possible with any method type of remote viewing, is that it then switches places. You become, you become the driver of the vehicle. And it allows me, you know, instead of it being chaos around me and me being an observer, I am now the person that says, okay, I'm enveloped in this process. I'm going to go here. I'm going to look there. I'm going to touch this, taste this, smell this. So I'm in control of it. And that's all, that's all a method does. That's all CRV does or any kind of remote view method. It makes you the, uh, the explorer in, in control of your own intuition. Yeah, that's such a beautiful analogy. And, you know, I love, I'm watching our, our pictures here and um, this is, symbolic of what's being talked about here just as far as when, when I first came on here I, I wanted all of our um, lighting to be you know just right and to have things controlled and you know structured and and everything and as I've been watching especially Ed there um, you know when you we started out I was like oh your light's not right but as you're talking about creative <laughs> expression I'm watching this beautiful sunlight pour in and the shadows of the blinds and, and the light flickering and it, it's just stunning to watch your picture now as it just unfolds so you know the uh, it's just like my remote viewing <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it, it's so just watching it is teaching me even about video production it's like okay, well, we need to have some things planned out, you know, so it's not a total disaster or a mess, but um, we, we have to be open to that creative expression. And, and I do, Absolutely. I've learned so much from talking to you guys today as well. And, you know, the whole idea of- Can, getting, I, can, go, go can I add one, just one, one more thing on, on the, because we were talking about CRV or, or training and, and not training with, with that topic. And um, 
I will always tell folks that if they're interested, that they should find a very a legitimate, real um, CRV teacher and apply it um, because what what that will do is allow that if they if they you go about the right way or if they have the right teacher or a good teacher or if they have the you know the, the direction to go in but what is what it will do is, is allow them to be begin to uh, uh, become aware of the processes below their own the threshold of their awareness which is what you have to do in order in order in my opinion to do remote viewing and be able to distinguish between different processes and so the, the, the pursuit or the training of, of CRV allows people to be, begin to kind of discipline themselves, and I say that term loosely, to be able to differentiate when they do go off into fantasy world and, and what is the difference between an actual input and actual remote viewing or going off into fantasy world. And, and um, that I think is why people should learn some some form of structure to allow themselves to become aware of those the difference between the two. And so I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, thank you. And you know, I, I really look at so, some of I think the the difficulty in um, or let's say this debate about do you need training or not comes from when the guys were in the military or in the research lab, they had the, the in the operational unit, they had uh, monitors or people, people that were sitting there with them. And when they would get stuck on something, they had help getting out of being stuck or they had someone pointing out what they were going through. And in the research unit, um, let's say with Russell Tarp, where he would, we've seen videos of incredible sessions with Hella Hammond, but he was, he was with her, he was blind to the target, so it wasn't that he was, you know, mentally leading her, but when you watch those videos, you, you can feel he's in a trance with her, and he's suggesting, go look over here, and if she starts to get off, he says, no, don't do that, go you know, go over from this angle and what do you see here? So in the past, they had, they worked as a team. The viewers, as far as I know, it maybe later on they started to, as they got more and more proficient, they worked on their own. But initially, they had someone walking through the process every moment. Fast forward to two decades later with us, we're all at our houses. Very few people have a, a monitor. Lori Williams, a CRV instructor that you guys all know and and who was one of my instructors she has jim her husband to do this for her but um very few people have this well what would you say to that well um i've never never been monitored in pretty much nearly two decades uh, i wouldn't know where to start with that process really um well, but i do understand i do understand though that uh See, I'm, I'm not sure where, I, I don't even know how all this works yet. I'm, I do know that there's some kind of thing that happens between tasker and uh, an analyst and remote viewer. I do feel that there's some kind of telepathic connection that goes on there. Um, and it may be the same with a monitor. So I, I, I don't know really on that one. Yeah, and I guess my point is just that because we don't have that, our, our monitors today are, are the structure or the training or you know what the teachers give us. We're, we need something so that since, since we don't have an outside party telling us what to do, we can go look at the little set of rules that tell us what to do when we're getting stuck and get past those things. That, that's all we have. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love using a monitor. I mean, I, I've had, you, you know, um, monitors who who had selected the target like my, my buddy jerry hearthcock and i've also used worked with monitors who who were blind to the target as well and uh, i love using a monitor uh, i i've found that i the there's like a combined stamina that comes through like with jerry we you know we had this idea of doing these full immersion sessions where remote view all day long for like two days or like 24 hours you know 
So like it'll end up 12 hours of remote viewing with a couple hours break in between because that's how we like to do it. You know, I mean, and, and, and there's just some stamina thing going on there. Uh, but even, even with monitors who, who are blind as well, there's just something that, that um, you know, as the viewers going through, you know, doing, doing our best to, to objectify all these experience, things that we're start suddenly experiencing, a monitor can pick up things that, that, that will, just, will just zip right past the, out of us. And we'll yeah. just, we're just like, oh, we got to keep going, got to keep going. But they'll be like, wait a minute, that thing you said over there was, was kind of interesting. Can you go back to that? You know? So it's kind of like Daz working with Courtney, where he'll send his, his sessions over and, hey, you know, you said something interesting here, like, or, or, or we would do with a project manager. Yeah. But with the monitor, they, it, it's right there. You know, it happens right there. Uh, I love working with monitors. I mean, I, I don't get to do it very often because it's a lot of coordinating, um, but oh, it's, I just think it's fantastic. I've, I've only really done it a few times, and um, I just wanted to punch my monitor out because they were <laughs> yeah. interrupting me. You know, I, I was like right there, and they were interrupting me, but of course, you know, it, yeah. it really depends on is the monitor in tune and sometimes I probably need to be interrupted because I'm focused on something that you know is emotionally stimulating but really isn't that important to the what I, what I will say is like like um, Jerry you know you know Jerry Jerry will select the target so he'll 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 know what the target is he doesn't know what is about the target is about but he'll, he'll select it it's some unknown thing to you know typically but the, the, the thing is, you have to be able, you have to trust this person, yeah. you know? So like when he and I get together, we're, we're two people who are so curious that we're, we're going to like, he says like we're riffing, you know, we're like a garage band, you know, we're just in the garage and we're riffing off each other with the guitars, you know, coming up with something. And, and it's, it's very much like that. But my excitement and, and curiosity and his intense curiosity it just builds this, it builds this energy and, and, um, and momentum. And it just really kind of, you know, his curiosity makes me curious. So if he, he's curious and I'm curious and we're, it just, it just grows. And, um, it's a lot of fun. It's just, it's just, I love it because it's just so much fun. We just have a great time, you know, but I trust him, which is what, what, yeah. what I wanted to say. Trust. Trust in relationship, very key to remote viewing, really, especially when you're working projects. And what I find over the years is I like, I have a similar kind of experience with Courtney, really. There's a, there's a trust there that I know that he's not going to give me a really absolutely crazy, stupid target that, you know, should just should not be a remote viewing target. Um, and he's not going to waste my time. Uh, so there's this dialogue and there's this relationship there. Uh, and it helps because I had this trust there and that trust allowed me then just to do my thing. Um, whereas there are other people that I've worked with and I've worked with them for years where I can outright say that I still do not trust them now that they won't pick a dodgy target. Um, and because of that, uh, my hit rate on targets with them is much less and of much less detail because that relationship does not, just not, not exist. So trust is very important. I think. Yeah. Very much. I have a question, Daz. Um, some people suggest that if the project manager, let's say in the case of, of Courtney, and for those tuning in, we're talking about Courtney Brown of the Farsight Institute, who does these really fantastic projects, but he is a controversial figure. And um, for example, we all know that he's really into aliens. And so there is the, the thought, well, if he really believes in aliens, then could his belief, if he gives someone a target, like let's say with the Phoenix Lights, how do we know that what you're tuning into is actually the truth and not just what Courtney believes to be true? Even though I know Courtney does everything he can so that you know his beliefs won't bleed into it, but how, how can we be sure you're not just reading his belief system? Well, I don't think we, we ever can be sure, really, um, because we don't know how remote viewing works, you know, even after these 40-odd years. We don't know what role the tasker plays. We don't, we don't know 
what, what role anyone plays. I mean, if you look at quantum mechanics and, and physics, and the observer theory, anyone that ever views or looks at what we do is integral as part of the project. So each, you know, all the people 10 years down the line that look at the videos that we're producing, they may be having an impact on, on the video as it's being produced when we actually did it. Because, you know, all this information travels backwards and forwards in time and it's all more local. So, yeah, we, we may never know that. But at the same time, um, in relation to the alien stuff, and, and, you know, not everyone knows this about me, but for the last 15 years, I've, I've run one of the biggest UFO websites on the internet. Um, uh, before I got into doing remote viewing, I was a UFO researcher in the UK. Uh, I accumulated 20,000 pages of freedom of information documents, and I had every major piece of footage from 1947 up to 2005. And we're talking about 18,000 hours of video footage. So oh I had no, what, can you tell us what your website is? Uh, the website is still up. I haven't updated it for about five years because, you know, I've moved on to remote viewing now, but it's called crowdedskies.com. Um, I went to all the UFO conferences. I, I've, I've amassed a huge library. I'm talking a huge library of thousands of UFO books, which I've read cover to cover. So if anything was ever going to influence my view of UFO targets, I would have thought it would be my own internal things. Like, for example, the Phoenix Lights. Uh, I, over the years, uh, I've done much more research on that project than, than Courtney could ever have influenced me with in any, in any way. Wow, I had no idea. And so then, uh, I know we have to come to a close pretty soon here, but my gosh, so you, of course, you were blind to the target, so you didn't know when he was tasking you with the Phoenix lights, that's what it was. It could have been any subject matter in the, the whole universe. Um, so did you learn something from the Phoenix Lights project that you hadn't known before from doing all this other research? Yeah, well, without a doubt. I mean, there, there's a part of me that believes, uh, because I've seen all these thousands of hours of footage and you know, photographs, documents, you know, you don't, when, you, when you read thousands of pages of documents from the FBI, the NSA, NASA, and everyone, we're talking about UFOs and aliens, you kind of, starting to build a picture that there's something happening out there. But at the same time, it's like everything else with me, I'm not 100% sure, you know, what, what is happening. I know something's happening, but I don't know beyond doubt. So that when I get to do a target like the Phoenix Lights, and the UFO ones, you know, don't come up that, many, that often for me in these 20 years that I've been doing this. But when I get to do like the Phoenix Lights one, and then I get the feedback and I, and I see that it's the Phoenix Lights, and I did it blind, that... That gives me more reinforcement than uh, seeing a video, seeing documents or anything else I can find on the internet because I know, you know, I know myself that Courtney didn't tell me that target. You know, he didn't subliminally tell me I did it completely blind. So I know myself that that information came from somewhere and it didn't come from my, my, my personal knowledge of the target because I was blind to it. I didn't know that's what I was viewing at the time. So it came from somewhere else and it just, just reinforces my view really. It, it kind of builds on it. You know, one thing that uh, it's in, in Joe McMonagle's book, Remote Viewing Secrets, he, he, he was talking about this subject and he was saying that when he was doing these outbounder experiments, what he, want, what he was interested in or in his own mind was to find something, he didn't want to read the person's mind. You know, he, he wanted to kind of, he wanted to kind of take that off the shelf that he's going to be reading the mind of the person who's at the location. And so he wanted to find something that was there that that person didn't see. And so he did this outbounder experiment and in his mind, he's like, yeah, and then there was this, you know, this red spiraling ladder, you know, or the staircase. And so the, 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 the outbounder person was that on the location and they didn't, they didn't see anything like that. So when Joe went there, he's like looking around for it. He's like, Hey, wait a minute. Did you go through that door? And the guy's like, no, I didn't go through that door. He goes and opens the door and there's this red spiral staircase, you know? So he was not, he's not reading this person's mind. Right. You know? he's, he, he, that's a big thing to keep in that we need to, you know, and that goes to the skeptics too, because the skeptics, are like oh oh they're 
it, they're just reading each other's mind. And they were like, that's no big deal. You know, <laughs> like, oh, that well, that's no big deal. Yeah. But it's well, more than that, more than that happening. Yeah, I, I found this out um, about a decade ago when I was doing clairvoyant training with some of my students over the phone. And I would give them, say, a, a photo to be describing. And I was looking at the photo right there and they would start to talk about um, just like reflections or they sometimes they talk about things that I was like, no, that's wrong. You know, that's not in it. And then I would watch back. I had filmed the whole thing um, or take pictures and I would see, oh, wait a second. There's, you know, they were, they were seeing this door inside this photo that was like a photo of a cat. I'm like, there's no door here. It's a cat. But when I look at the photo, you can see the reflection of the, of the door in my office right there in the photo. So I had a number of experiences like that, or they saw something moving and I'm like, no, there's not anything moving. And then when I look back at it later, yes, the wind was blowing the whole time. So I started to realize they're tuning into things that I'm not aware of. So it can't be them just reading my mind. There, there's a combination. But yeah, I, think that, I think that goes along too of, of um, expectations. This is something I've talked about a lot too is are what what do and this goes uh, along of how people perceive remote viewing as a topic and um and expectations i think are, are a big limiter because if if somebody comes into this and they think that their session is going to be an exact representation of the feedback photo then they're the ones who are most likely to move on to something else mm -hmm. 10 minutes later uh, because there's so much going on. It's like that, like in like the, the tip of the iceberg thing, you know, there's so much going on. I mean, I've had a lot of targets where I've, I've done the session and I, and I know in the session, I, something was happening, you know, the, an actual remote viewing was taking place. I could tell there, there's a, there's a, there's a something almost tangibly specific about that experience as opposed to another process in my mind creating something they're, they're two completely different textures of, of, of sorts and so so certain things i'll have to go and 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 research it's like ah there it is you know that's that's what it was or, or maybe move back in time and back in time yeah that's what i was interested in you know so i mean we're dealing with a with an unknown we don't we don't know how this works and we don't know how we can do this. And just in trying to, to understand what exactly took place during an actual remote viewing is a whole, is a whole nother field to study. Uh, because like, you know, like Ingo was said in many of his or any of those guys, it could take a long time before you get your feedback because you get to try to find what it, is, what it was that you were actually drawn to, uh, to, to describe. Well, and, and I love what um, both of you have said, but what Dad, what Dad said a little while ago, which is there may be people in the future that are looking at the videos that, that you guys are putting out right now when they're, when they're watching you guys do your work. In, in two decades from now, they may look back at what you did and, and really learn from it, you know, and see where you may have, um, you know, gotten off or, or just learn about phenomena that we're not even aware of yet, but that there's going to be a record now that they can study. You know, that's one of the things that I've been really advocating for in the different remote viewing groups that I work with is that there's, there actually is so much good work being done right now. You know, whether it's this video work, there's so much in associative remote viewing. I mean, hundreds, thousands of trials going on, but a lot of it isn't getting written up and it's not getting reported. And there's small communities that talk about it and share and learn from each other. But it's so important to create this historical record. And I know I'm just preaching to the choir because I mean, look mm -hmm. at Daz. Daz, you, can you just, in wrapping up here, let people know what it is that you have on your website, and because you have really created the largest historical record um, of, of remote viewing material that there is freely available to the public. So how can people access that information? Yeah, uh, they can find it on uh, www.remoteview.com. Uh, and at the moment it has, Oh, it has everything. It has hundreds of my remote viewing sessions. It has some of Ed's. It has uh, some of 
well, anyone's on there. It's got all the military remote viewers, remote viewing sessions. I think I have about 300 of theirs from the SRI program. That's thousands of pages of documents from the Stargate program itself, from SRI, and you know all the all the important documents. Uh, it has a vast bibliography of books, papers, transcripts, radio interviews. That's all on there. Uh, lots of posts that people have from their very early conversations in in news groups. Yeah, pretty much anything you'd want to find is, is on there, really. Okay, and and what is the website again? It's remoteviewed.com remoteview.com okay and yeah and i hope you'll you know ed may is releasing a lot of the stargate material that never came out so i, I hope that you can get with, right here with him and I'm, yeah i mean I, i'm very interested in this um because le well you know i don't want to get into it but legally he shouldn't you know there shouldn't be stuff that he has that isn't in the public domain and owned by the people that you know the taxpayer to pay for it um well, well, I'm, I'm, that he says hasn't been released before because that's yes that's exciting it's interesting yes i'm I'm dying to see what it is and uh he's claimed for many years that you know there's stuff in there that says that crv doesn't work never worked or never worked any better than anything else even though you know the rest of the stargate documents do not reflect that fact so I'm interested to see see what that is, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I just want to share, um, getting back to the UFO topic. Well, this morning when I woke up, I was lying in bed, and I saw this face. At first, it looked like an Asian woman looking at me, and I'm like, who is this? And then I noticed the eyes were, like, completely black. And I was like, huh, this kind of looks like an alien. And I was like, well, I'm going to be meeting with Daz and Ed. So who mm -hmm. is most likely to have some connection with some kind of odd looking alien being? So I, <laughs> I didn't see anything more than that, but it was kind of a strange thing to wake up to. So we'll, we'll see on that one. Well, I think, I think if, if we could go for just one more hour, we could really get into some really good stuff here. I think we're just getting warmed up here. I know. Well, we'll meet back here again soon. Let's, yeah. let's do this again for part, part two. And, and Ed, how can people get in touch with you and, and see some of your work? Uh, well, my website, erviewer.com, um, that has a lot of my sessions up there and as well with, uh, as some some blog posts and that kind of thing. I haven't updated that in a long time because um, I just, I don't like writing up a lot of stuff. I, I, you know, my, I just, it just drives me nuts trying to write up all kinds of stuff. I just like to do the videos and put them up. So, um, but there, there's a lot of stuff on ERViewer.com and then uh, everything is on my YouTube page and that's just Edward Reardon. So I think I have, I think I just uploaded a hundred number 120 or something like that. So there's plenty of stuff up there of all different types. Um, I try to try to cover every protocol type that I could think of, be it straight CRV, uh, triple blind, double blind, single blind, uh, everything except for front loaded. <laughs> I'll never do a front loaded session. So I, I basically try to put up everything every other tri type of combination, but you'll never, never see anything front loaded other than uh, I did ex do some videos where I wanted to explore specific things. So they were only people targets or they were only object targets or they were only lo they were location targets. And so I had uh, just a piece of that being, okay, the target is a person um, only because I'm, I was curious as to, uh, f as to, being able to explore more of how I remote view people or how I remote view places. Um, so that, that kind of thing, but uh, they're all total blind other than that. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys so much. It has been such a pleasure meeting with you guys and um, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Daz. And, yeah. and I'd like to say thank you to all of our viewers. Thank you so much for tuning in um, to our first episode, very first episode of The Other Side of the Curve. I'm your host, Deborah Lynn Katz, 
And until next time, have a just a wonderful time exploring all the different realms of your conscious and subconscious and having a great time doing what you love to do, whatever that is.